we teach classes also. You're not going to want to miss the one that she has, but it's great to be on here. So today we are going to talk about helping your child be prepared for school in every way, um, to have good success in school, in study, um, homework time, uh, all that kind of things. Um, and also some, we'll talk some about the, the current situation of our world um, and how school is different than just the standard school. So more stress, some, some different um, maybe restrictions or situations that are happening um, potentially for your children. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So very excited to be here. Okay. So um, the things that we are going to talk about specifically, uh, how to care for your eyes. This is helpful anyway, even when we just read books, we had to keep care, take, take care of our eyes. But also um, with screens, there's extra things that we need to do. So discussing that, we're going to talk about mind care. And this is how to help your brain be clear, how to feed your brain well, um, how to keep it clean from toxins or to help it to be clean, and what to do if you get a concussion, playing sports, things like that. So we'll touch briefly on that. Um, and then creating an environment where learning is facilitated and talking about different scenarios where your kids may need a different environment for homework than you currently have. So we'll discuss that. Um, the last thing that I added on when I, after I thought about this was really discussing body autonomy. This is a big discussion in a lot of ways. Um, we talk about it a lot with bullying now, um, have been for the last 10, 20 years, I don't know how long, but um, there's other ways that body autonomy is really important. And in different states, there is a, uh, there are, there's more potential that your child will need to stand up for their own body autonomy. So we want to make sure that we talk about that. So th that is what you're looking forward to um, in the class today. So let's just dive right in. Overall, why are we taking care of our bodies? Well, we're taking care of our bodies because they're ours to take care of. We want to help our bodies and our children's bodies to be strong and healthy because they're going to function better that way. They're going to learn. They're going to um, be able to retain information and make connections when they're functioning. Um, if you're getting headaches because you can't see the board or because your eyes are tired from the screens, it's not going to help you to learn. Um, so it, what can we do to help our children learn the best that they can where they're at in the situation that they're in? Ooh, excuse me. So let's get started on that. All right, eye care. Eye care is a nice topic to start with because it is fairly straightforward and simple. <laughs> in every area of our body, every organ, every gland, every well, con, well, eyes are considered an organ, I suppose. Um, there is a mineral and a vitamin that's most needed for that. Um, the vitamin needed for the eye is A. A lot of us know that. <clears throat> and so vitamin A is something that you can get in fat, in animal fats, is one of the best sources for vitamin A. You may think, oh, we were told to eat carrots for our eyes. And yes, beta carotene is a precursor to vitamin A. So good metabolism. Um, if we have all the cofactors, we can convert beta carotene into vitamin A. But if you don't have that, it's better to just eat vitamin A from the source, which is animal fat. Uh, different fats have vitamin A in them, higher amounts. Uh, Weston A. Price actually has a log of different animal fats and their vitamin A and vitamin D content, which is pretty fun. Cod liver oil is one of the best sources of vitamin A. We recommend green pastures cod liver oil with the concentrated butter oil right here, um, or Rosita's cod liver oil if you can't tolerate the fermentedness of the cod liver oil of the green pastures. The other things that the, the eyes need, um, they do need some cholesterol. Uh, that's going to help them to function well. And I was seeing if I know the mineral. I don't think it's listed on this list. I don't know the mineral for the eyes. I'm sorry. Uh, it's probably in my chart over there. Magnesium seems to be ringing a bell, but I don't quote me on that. When we are eating enough vitamin A, our eyes can be rested. Um, sometimes if your eyes are very tired or you're getting a lot of um, running eyes, like uh, tear ducts that are crying, or dry eyes, 
both of those can indicate that your vitamin A is low, so try eating more fat. Now, one of the things that bridges over into mind care is vitamin A is found in animal fats, and so is cholesterol. And cholesterol is really great for the brain as well as the nervous system. So we won't go to the mind yet, but let's connect, or the brain yet, but let's connect the, the eyes neurologically back into the brain. So vitamin A, but also vitamin B are very helpful for making sure the connections from our nerves and our muscles are working well. Um, it's pretty cool to see also if your eyes are not focusing well, there are things that you can do about that that are not glasses. Sometimes your primitive reflexes are not integrated properly. And we've had both Emily Roper and Bonnie Eason come and talk to us on previous videos about um, your primitive reflexes or primary reflexes and how to integrate those so that you can continue to build on them and mature and function in a, a higher capacity. So we can do that for our kids if that is a problem, especially eyes that are jumping. They can't converge. They can't focus. All of those things are probably reflex issues as opposed to um, an eye issue. So it's pretty cool. We can do something about that. So eye health. We can eat food for the eyes. You can eat carrots. That's great. Um, but also make sure you're eating animal fat. You can do reflex work, um, primitive reflex work for your eyes, that can help if you're having issues with muscles. What about screens? So the strain on our eyes is very draining, both to our eyes themselves and also to the brain. So again, B vitamins, vitamin A, cholesterol, all help to refresh and nourish that um, as if any kind of strain or stress on our body. We need cholesterol and fat soluble vitamins to help that. A practical thing that you can do for your eyes. I learned this looking for ways to help my eye strain looking at the computer. And there are exercises that you can do, <coughs> very simple. Um, you pick a point and then let your eyes go blurry. So you're seeing double vision. Do that for 20 to 30 seconds and then focus them again. Excuse me. Um, focus them again. With that focus, you are getting or with the unfocus, it's helping your eyes relax. It's like stretching your muscles and then relaxing them. And that's helped, you know, if a sore muscle, right? If you've got a tight shoulder, what do you do? You push your arms backwards, kind of tights, you pull it, but then when you relax, oh, that muscle is able to release a lot better. So same way, I don't know if it's working exactly the same way, but in that stretching of your muscle fibers, it is the extra tightening of your fibers that allows them then to relax further. So I don't know if the, I don't study eyes, I'm sorry. If there are any ophthalmologists on here ever watching this, just let us know what's going on. So what you wanna do is unfocus your eyes, which does some kind of different muscle lengthening, right? And then reconverge them. And that can help your eyes if they are tired. Another thing to consider would be blue light blocking glasses. These can be worn maybe just in the evening after the sun goes down for homework at night, or you may find wearing them all day to be helpful. There are some actually prescription glasses that you can get with the blue light blocking now. You wanna make sure that you're not just buying something that says they are, right? Do something that's actually working properly. You could get just plain blue light blocking glasses, and a lot of them don't have that really, you know, lame yellow big glass look. There are some very cute, very modern looking blue light glasses. So feel free to take whatever style you want as long as it's from a company you trust that actually is going to provide protection. Make sure that they've done studies or have some way to prove that they are in fact blocking blue lights. Blue lights are very just stressful and straining on our eyes, especially when we see them all day um, or look at them for long periods of time or if we're seeing them at night. So again, you may find that you do better wearing them all day long or your child may do better with moods and fatigue and irritability. Um, it's not just, oh, I'm tired. It can be anger, irritability um, that manifests and that could be from the blue light, just irritating and stimulating the nervous system. So that could be something to try um, try during homework if you're having trouble winding down, getting them to wind down and get to sleep, um, or try wearing it all day. The last thing that I think is really fun, and there is some 
research about it, but most of it is historical that I found, is bilberry fruit. Bilberry fruit, uh, you can get as a powder, you can also get it as a jam, and it was said, and it is, it did happen in World War II, the pilots of the British Royal Navy, I think is what it was called, British Royal Air Force, probably that one, um, were required to eat bilberry fruit every day. And that is because it improves night vision and helps with, with eye health. So um, it is very possible to improve your eye health. Um, and those are some of the main highlights. So in summary, eye health is eating vitamin A and cholesterol, animal fat containing vitamin A, but also other things, um, including cholesterol. Potentially bilberry fruit is another thing to eat. You can eat carrots if you want to also. It's definitely not gonna hurt. Um, and if you can convert it, you will get some vitamin A from that. Um, you also want to do relaxation exercises for your eyes if they're getting very tired or just closing your eyes and resting them can be helpful as well. And then think about doing blue light blocking glasses. You can do blue light blocking on your screen. Um, I've been told by people who study this that some of the apps that do blue light dimming on your screen aren't actually doing it. Um, there's probably some benefit from just a decreased stimulation if there's more oranges, but it doesn't actually block the blue spectrum. It just changes. It seems like what, what I understand from what they're telling me is it just changes the coloring, but it doesn't actually stop the blue light from coming through. It just makes the other colors more dominant. I don't know which ones that's that are correctly working and which ones aren't, but just be aware that that's something I just recently learned that not all nighttime screens are actually helpful. Mm, I am. <coughs> Lots of things today. Sneezy, yawny. That's interesting. Okay. Mind care. Um, mind or brain care, they're two different things. Mind care, we refer more to the thinking part of our mind, um, the not physical part, and brain generally refers to the physical part of our brain. So let's start with brain care first. Things the brain needs. Cholesterol, vitamins A, uh, vitamins D a little bit. Um, also minerals to some extent. Manganese is one of the minerals our brain, especially pituitary gland needs. So you need to keep your body, to keep your brain working, you need to eat lots of fat. Also lots of B vitamins, uh, especially one, two, three, and four, but truly all the B vitamins are helpful for our brain. And you want to make sure you're getting enough good, healthy minerals from a good salt like Baja Gold or Celtic sea salt. Okay, so that is brain health, just keeping it healthy. Biggest thing in there is cholesterol. The second thing, though, not just is your brain healthy, but actually is your, what if you get injured? So it's stay on brain, but you get injured. You are playing sports, and you hit, get hit in the head hard. Your kid gets hit in the head hard. What do you do? Number one, you feed the brain with things it needs to repair. So same thing, B vitamins, um, fat, cholesterol, minerals, um, and then also potentially things like RNA or tuna omega-3, or that's the standard process, but omega-3 oils um, from a good sourcing of fish. You want a small batch of fish, not, not like Sam's Club or Costco, um, but a small batch processing of fish um, from fish that are from cleanest waters possible. It's very difficult to get really clean waters in our world anymore, which is sad, but Things that are more directly close to China are probably going to be less clean. So there you go. Number two, so feed your brain. Cholesterol, omegas, um, B vitamins, and some minerals are going to be helpful. If you keep hitting your head or if it was a really bad hit, uh, we've mentioned PMGs on the channel, but you can sometimes do a PMG for the nerves, and that can help your brain repair if it's a chronic issue. That would be something you'd want to talk to a practitioner like us about if you want to do that. Um, number two is mind. <laughs> so the brain well and sick we talked about, but also what about the mind? How do we help the mind? Now, it's very difficult and we don't understand the separation between the mind and the brain. So what I would like to refer to the mind is as the physical part of the thinking as opposed to the like soul, which is like more of you as self, right? So this is the part of your, the mind I'm describing as the part of you that is thinking. 
making connections, just understanding things. There is a physical connection of the brain that helps to connect to those neurons, but it, it doesn't, yeah, we don't, we don't get it. Some people may get it, but they're interconnected. How do we get our thinking to be better? So there's a few things that you can do just generally. Um, one, having, we're gonna talk about environment in a second, but one, having a good nourished brain is going to allow you to think better. Having a brain that's clean is also gonna have you think better. So if your child has eaten a lot of sugary treats or a lot of red dye number fives or things like that, those are neurotoxins and they will be up irritating the brain and the receptors in the brain that will allow them to not think as well or disallow them to be as able to make connections or to learn things. The diet has a huge, huge effect on your child's ability to think and their brain's ability to, to process physically and to be in a healthy state and not be distracted by toxins or chemicals floating around. I know it's really hard, especially going back to school. It's often when kids eat worse because they're back to school, they're sharing lunches with their friends. So this is a place where it's really important to be chatting with your children. What is it that those foods are doing to their body. Do they notice that if they have that um, fake red dye number five fruit snack, um, that homework is a lot harder than when they have Russian custard or something else for dessert. So see if you can help them make connections so that they can make good choices um, in school. Depending on how old they are and what's going on, you may or may not be able to control what they eat at school. But what you can do is help them choose wisely, um, which is ultimately setting them up for doing well in the rest of their life. Because for the rest of their life, they're going to um, choose what they eat and what they're going to put in their bodies. So helping them start making those decisions now is really great. So not a lot of toxicity is number two. Number one is feed and nourish the brain. Now, if we have older children, um, if you as an adult want to be able to study well, um, there are herbs that can really enhance ginkgo, um, go to cola complex, things like that. They're not all good for everyone. So that's something where you want to talk to someone who knows what they're doing. Um, talk to someone like us in your appointment. Talk to your nutritionist, um, wherever, uh, wherever you go and get that advice to see what might be something that's helpful for your brain. One thing I do want to talk about, though, is a particular supplement that Standard Process has called OPC Synergy. Um, OPC Synergy with an S. OPC Synergy was actually tested in clinical trials against Adderall and found to perform better. Um, it is a, a blend of herbals and other things, and it is something that we use for kids. So if you are a patient of our clinic and you want to try that out, let us know because um, we're happy to talk about if that's the right thing for your child. What it does is, what all stimulants do, even for ADD, is the brain actually is under-stimulated um, with ADD, and the movement is helping to try to get the brain and the neurotransmitters and the receptors what it needs um, with movement, where it's not happening in the normal processes of just sitting still and thinking. And so if you actually stimulate the brain with some stimulants, then the body can sit still because it's not needing to stimulate itself. So OPC Synergy does that, and it is something that can be helpful. It's a, you know, it's a very natural thing, and so it is safe to do, um, not necessarily on your own, because any recommendations that we make about supplements here that aren't just food, like liver or cod liver oil, you wanna make sure that you're talking to your practitioner to see if it's a right and good decision for your kids. It can be really helpful though if you need it. So definitely don't hesitate to reach out um, or talk to your person that you get standard process from <laughs> and see if that is something that would help your kid. Okay, last thing is study environment about learning. Last thing about learning is study environment. The environment makes a huge difference. So think about what I just talked about, about the toxins and how they can be just irritating and it's hard to think in. If the environment that your child is trying to do homework in is like that, it's going to be very difficult to concentrate. We experience this as adults, you know this. What if you walk into a room that looks like my office right now, not what you can see, because I've cleaned it up for the camera, but everything I can see, it's very difficult to concentrate because it is busy, 
there's piles of to-do lists and things that are undone that are reminding me constantly that I need to do them. That is not a helpful work environment, um, and it's not a good environment for me right now, right? And I do struggle when my environment is like this to focus because how do you how do you make sense of it when you're constantly being distracted by, oh, I've got to do that too, and what's over there, and what color is that, and why is he eating that sandwich, and you know things like that. So when you are creating an environment of homework for your child, um, try to keep in mind what it looks like through their eyes. And also judge based on how your child is acting if you have done a good job or not. So if you are noticing that they are distracted with their homework, especially if that's unusual, but even if it's usual, try this. Because just because the brain is too busy and the environment's too busy, if we get the environment less busy, you'll do better, right? Even if the brain's still busy and we haven't figured out the neurotransmitters here yet, if your environment is less busy and it's quiet and there's not distractions, it just helps the brain out. So um, it's a very, very simple, I say it and you're like, of course that's what you should do. But we, we don't always think of that. So look at your environment for your child and how they're doing their homework. Is it calm? Is it quiet? Um, milieu is actually the word to describe an environment. Um, and that environment is very helpful to what happens and how we react with the world. So if your milieu or your child's milieu, M-I-L-E-U, I think is how it's spelled. If your child's milieu is stressful and chaotic and unorganized, or there's all their homework out and homework stresses them out, they're probably going to really struggle to get their homework done. If you have their homework maybe lined up, um, in a file folder in order that you decided beforehand or you put it in the bag or put it on the table in the other room behind them something like that and while you are doing homework with them you are only doing the homework in front of them the table is cleared off there's no extra noise no TVs going no screens going no siblings hanging out especially if this is a big deal Sometimes it's good to do it with your sibling next door, right? And you're sitting in the chairs and doing homework together. But if your child really is struggling with focus and concentration, it may be better to have them be alone um, when they're doing their school. Okay, so we have the milieu is calming. There may be is some music, but that often is too stimulating. Um, if the brain is having trouble concentrating, even soothing music or classical music is actually over complicating, I don't want to use the word stimulating, but over complicating to the brain too much for it to think about and it keeps getting pulled away and distracted. Um, clear table and environment, quiet, and then no rush, no pressure um, environment is good. Um, some recommendations will say, you know, write a list of things that you want to think about, um, like do homework one at a time, um, stay calm, uh, just because you don't get it the first time doesn't mean you're stupid, right? Write phrases that are maybe really important to your child and how they um, learn and how you notice are difficult for them. My dog is trying to get my attention. Okay. That's a great study environment. Other study environment. Um, maybe your child hates being alone. They can concentrate fine, and if you send them up to their room to do homework, they will keep coming out and seeing you because they actually just want to be part of what's going on. So depending on what issues are going on, you don't have to sequester your child away. Just do what's best for them. If it is quiet and calm and nothing distracting or stressful, then make sure that's what's happening. If they are bored um, and want to be part of the family, then that's good. Now, they should maybe be in another room with noise going on in the background not sitting in front of the TV doing school. That's not a good way to retain um, any kind of knowledge or learning. So figure out what to do there. Um, try to make it as simple and low stress as possible. If you are stressed about homework, they're probably going to be stressed about homework. If stress has been part of homework time, maybe talk about it as a family of how this year, let's try it different. We're going to mess up. Sometimes it's going to be stressful but we want to strive for it to be not stressful. So try to get your um, self calmed down and get out of any patterns in the family. Okay, last thing would be body autonomy. So look at this, I'm giving you a quick, short lecture. Never do that. All right, body autonomy 
um, there's two things that are really important in this. One, that body autonomy is a right of every person, um, and it's important to teach that to your child. They have a right to their body, and they have a right to say what happens to their body, and that means everything. That means no one can push them or touch them without their permission, um, including grown-ups. Um, that means no one can do something, um, including medical procedures, to them without their permission. And let them know that they have that right, and if someone is violating that right, they, they should tell you, and that you want them to tell you. So that can be everything from bullying to different kinds of assault to um, things like being pressured to get certain medical procedures. Um, it's really important for your child to understand, especially in some of the bills that have been signed into law in Colorado about minor consent. It's really important your child knows that consent means they could say yes and they can say no. Making sure that you teach this not in a I'm scared so you should be scared way, right? That's not good, but just as a fact. Hey, did you know that your body is yours and no one can do anything without your permission? And if someone is doing something without your permission, you tell them to stop. And if they don't stop, you call me. Um, and then if they do something, like tell me later, right? You can have that follow-up question. So um, teach that, make sure they understand that, age appropriately, and be sure to not bring your own fears into it because that's really important. The other thing is reinforcing. Don't just teach once and then decide that you can, you know, oh, they got it, they definitely understood it, um, but you don't say it again. Um, we need reinforcement, especially when we're young, especially when we're very young. So while minor consent is 12, um, according to the legislation that uh, just was passed um, in Colorado, other things like bullying and inappropriate touch and things like that happen in lots of different ages. And it's, it's a sad reality, hopefully not common or doesn't happen to your child, but it won't happen to your child or it will be caught right away if it happens to your child if you teach them about body autonomy and that they have the right to have a say in what happens to their body. So just really keeping um, that, again, age appropriately teaching them, hey, this is your body and you don't have to, like if anyone's doing something to your body, you can always say stop if you don't like it or they, you know, it's good if people ask permission and even helping practice, having them ask permission before they do something. Because what do we do as people, especially children? Um, we mirror what we see. So if you are teaching, and this includes to your child, um, if you're teaching that you are asking permission um, before you do things, like, don't be excessive about it, but um, then you um, do that. I really have tried implementing that here. And sometimes I forget, um, because I forget with adults too. <laughs> it's not just about kids. But I really do ask at the beginning of appointments with kids, I ask, hey, here is you know what I'm going to do. I want to talk about your body and, and see if it's healthy and strong and what ways we can make it more healthy and strong. Would that be okay with you? Um, we have, you know, when I'm doing something like listening to their heart, I tell them what I'm doing and say, is it okay if I listen? Can I take off your shoes? Um, I'm going to feel your lymph nodes. Is that okay? So making sure that we are even mirroring that. Um, now, it doesn't mean that you're about to curl them up in a, a hug, which they're running towards you for, and you need to be like, hold on, before you run and hug me, um, can I have permission to hug you back? Like, no, of course, they're giving you permission, right? So don't, like, don't f make it be, uh, you know, imbalanced thing, but when things are happening, giving them permission or letting them know it's happening. Because sometimes you need to do things um, without their permission because you are their parent and that is okay. Um, but most things we can't actually ask permission and just modeling that to them, teaching them to do it to you um, and to other kids and other adults. Um, and then just expecting that or asking that of other adults that see, um, see that. You don't have to hug your great aunt if you don't want to, um, right? Or you can hug them in a little bit once you warm up to remembering who they are kind of thing. So body, body autonomy is really important and reinforcing it is important. Again, you don't have to remember, do it every day. Although, you know, parents say, I love you, you know, have fun, be safe every day. Um, so if you feel like you're in a good place and it's not stressful or um, 
psychologically like anxiety causing in your child, um, you may find a little phrase of, hey, have fun. Uh, remember that your body's yours and, you know, and if someone isn't, if people aren't treating it with respect, then you can always let me know. Maybe once a week or once a month, right? To say something like that. So that that would be my thought on body autonomy. Um, and it's important to review with kids of all ages, um, even your older teens, because while they're so grown up and adult in so many ways, they are still a kid, and the pressure of an authority figure asking something. Um, and their logic to be able to know that they can say no, that's gonna be really hard if they have not had certain um, backing from you to say, this is okay, this is your right to say no, and I want to know about it if someone's pressuring you to do things you're uncomfortable with, right? And you don't have to, again, describe what it is that you're uncomfortable with. Um, they're, they're gonna know. Just trust your child to inherently know if something's wrong. Your goal is not to teach them to trust their instincts. Your goal is to say, I trust your instincts too, and if something happens against your instincts, come and tell me about it. Okay, so that's really your job. You don't have to teach them what's inappropriate. You just need to tell them if something happens that they're uncomfortable with, that the right thing to do is talk to you. So, okay, all right. Well, that is all I had prepared for today. Just a really simp simple, quick tricks of eye health, mind care, um, good study environment, just as a reminder for that, and body autonomy. Another thing that we have that's very special to this year, but I didn't want to talk about it because Holly's going to talk about it, um, is mask wearing. So she's going to interview in a couple weeks, two Tuesdays from now, she's going to interview um, a practitioner in the North Glen office sharing with their, where, where our office is there, sharing one of the rooms. Um, that person has a lot of good thoughts about anxiety, reducing anxiety, including in mask wearing, because a lot of our Kids maybe are needing to wear masks, um, depending on what the school is and what the situation is um, that is happening for people. So um, that is something I would not miss. I would definitely do that. The other thing is remembering what works to calm your child. Just an overall thing. Are essential oils helpful? Do they really love their favorite blanket? Um, is it more comfortable to do homework with a pillow on the chair? Like just don't uh, try to make things as easy as possible while they're doing a hard thing. Um, and then emotionally supporting them, letting them know those things I just barely touched on, that environment. I kind of wrapped it in with the environment, but because I talk about it so much more in detail in other things, but letting your child know they're not stupid because they can't figure it out. Everyone learns things at once. Some people, it's harder to learn certain things. Some people are good at math and some people are good at English. It doesn't mean anything's wrong with you. And most people don't know what's going on and everyone pretends that they do know what's going on. So if you feel like you're lost in class and no one else is, there's a good chance that you're not alone. And if they truly are alone, um, reassure them that you are not upset at them, you love them, and you're there to help them just like you help them in every other way um, with, their, with their life. So, okay. That's all I got. Thanks for watching this. Um, thanks for joining in replay when you do. Um, you can comment below and we, we do see those and get to answering those about once a week. I make sure that uh, we make sure that we check and answer any messages at this point. So try to get on and answer those as quickly as we can. Um, and if you like this, please subscribe. Um, please share with your friends. If this is a topic that's helpful to them, please share. Um, with them and we appreciate you helping us um, get the word out of just good support and help to our bodies and our children during school. Have a good night everyone and we will see you 